Well, first of all, let me uh, express my appreciation to First Presbyterian, to her pastor and staff in session uh, for their invitation, kind invitation to come and speak on a hero of mine, Robert Murray McShane. Uh, I, uh, I am a son of uh, across the river in the Transjordan. I'm a son of South Carolina, and I, I lost my heart uh, in two places. One was to my, my uh, uh, little girl that I met in the fourth grade, who's now my wife. And the other is I lost my heart in Scotland when I went to do PhD studies at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, the family and I had also had the privilege of a sabbatical year. We fled the country uh, in the wake of the arriving millennium. Just before the millennium uh, bell tolled, we uh, arrived in Scotland and uh, did a, a uh, pulpit swap for a year with the pastor of St. Peter's Dundee, David Robertson, who holds the pulpit of Robert Murray McShane. So we were, um, uh, I was uh, filling the pulpit and living in the manse and uh, breathing the air and, and feeling the heartbeat of this uh, great and generous man touched uh, by our generous God. Uh, let me read a theme verse uh, for our time. We're going to talk a lot about history and culture and ministry and the work of God in hearts, but uh, let me uh, speak to you directly from the Word of God. McShane was a young man, you can see by his dates, uh, dying uh, in his youth, really. And so we remember the words of the Apostle Paul as he spoke to young Timothy and uh, reminded him that he was not to let anyone look down on his youth, your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. And until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching, and do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed upon you through the prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands of the presbytery. Take pains in these things, be absorbed in them so that your progress may be evident to all. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. Uh, let us pray. Our most gracious and merciful Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ is King and Lord of all and that he touches our hearts and lives and makes a difference in the way that we live and think and feel. We thank you for the difference that he has made in the lives of those that have gone before us, not so that we can worship them, but so that we can worship you and your son uh, from our hearts and from our lives. We ask, O oh Lord, as we think about this Scottish divine of old, that we would think of Christ and him crucified. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Robert Murray McShane. Bear with me for one second. There we go. Robert Murray McShane was a Scottish divine who passed away on the eve of the Scottish disruption. He was a young minister in the Church of Scotland protesting the intrusion of the state into the life of the church. Now that may sound like a very ephemeral and theological thing, but in order to understand this man, we're going to have to understand something of his context. First of all, we have to understand something of his historic context. He lived in the 19th century, that is in the 1800s, uh, in the early part of that century. And we have to know something about the land from which he hailed. And so we'll look uh, a little bit at, at Scotland and the things of Scotland. Uh, the cultural context, particularly in the city of Dundee, where he ministered at St. Peter's Church, uh, is important to us to appreciate what his ministry was like. And then also the context of generosity in which he lived uh, also is one that had a very strong religious context and component. And we have to understand that. Uh, let me just say unabashedly that my goal with you this morning is to do basically two things. Uh, there's no way that I can go into great depth about uh, all aspects of Robert Murray McShane's life. Rather, what I'm trying to do is to spark your interest. Right up front, I am a fisherman and I have a hook with a worm on it, and it's a beautiful, lovely worm called Scotland. <laughs> 
And uh, I'm going to try to entice you to further reading. Now, on McShane himself, uh, there are two volumes that are classic that you can choose. One is included in the other. You can get the short version of his life uh, by Andrew Bonar, The Life of Robert Murray McShane, or you can read that book in this one and some of his sermons and his poetry and a whole set of his letters, which are quite moving. The Memoir and Remains of Robert Murray McShane, edited by Andrew Bonar. I encourage you, you can pick these up on the internet. The Banner of Truth always keeps them in print. And so if you want to know more, if we succeed today in, in interesting you more in McShane, uh, then pick up those volumes. But I've also bought, brought uh, three of my favorite books about Scotland. Uh, the first is The Scottish Psalter. Uh, this has uh, uh, the Scottish metrical psalms at the bottom and staff uh, notes at the top rather than the sola system because uh, we're in a new generation. But I commend to you the singing of God's word. The Scots teach us the importance of singing the psalms. God has given us his word written in order to teach and train our minds and hearts. And the psalms are a great way to feel the gospel and to feel the goodness of Christ. And so I brought a Scottish metrical psalter. If you want to look at it afterwards, you're free to. Uh, secondly, to hook you on Scotland, I bought, brought the uh, picture book by Colin Baxter, who, who has to be one of the best photographers in, in Scotland in the modern age. Uh, there is not a scene in the Highlands which he has not captured with great flavor and beauty. And I commend uh, an enjoyment of the, the wilds and nature of Scotland uh, Colin Baxter is a great one through whom to do that, or you can just uh, visit there sometime. And then finally, perhaps my favorite book of Scotland is uh, A Guide to the Blessed Places to Eat and Stay in Scotland. It's called a, a Taste of Scotland. This is the millennial edition. It includes lots of recipes to give uh, to your wife as well. So um, anyway, I commend A Taste of Scotland to you. On a more serious note, if you want to read about Scottish history, then this volume may be for you. Uh, it's A Short History of Scotland by Richard Killeen, and it's got lots of pictures and uh, some recognition of Presbyterian heritage in the country. Now, if you really want to dig into your Presbyterian roots, then uh, you need to look at David Calderwood's edition, uh, The True History of the Church of Scotland from the beginning of the Reformation unto the end of the regime or the reign of King James VI. Uh, this is a, a folio edition from let's see, uh, 1678, uh, and you're welcome to look but not touch. <laughs> so we have to know something about the context in which Robert Murray McShane was ministering. Now, it's Scotland that we're talking about. Here is, is the land of Bonnie Scotland, and uh, we have a, a, a map at the top that shows you the major cities like Edinburgh, and Glasgow on the other side, and Inverness at the north, and and folks out on the Western Isles, Skye and the Lewis, and they, it's a, a beautiful and rugged land, one of the last uh, unspoiled portions of wilderness in the north for all of Europe. Uh, here is a tourist map, uh, obviously written by someone from Edinburgh, because Glasgow does not appear at all <laughs> anywhere on the map. Uh, the Isle of Skye is there, so there's no... Uh, uh, there's no westernmost Isle of Lewis and Harris and Uist, etc. Those don't exist. This is the general breakdown of the country. And, and the kind of area that we're talking about, Edinburgh, is where McShane was born. And then he ended up ministering Dun in Dundee, just north of there in the central district on uh, the Firth of Tay. Now, when we think of Scotland, <laughs> there are really two things we think of. Uh, the one that's most important is, of course, golf. And... Uh, that's because we have the Augusta National, and we know we are as good, if not better, than they are at these things. And then we have Sean Connery uh, in a kilt. Uh, let me say, I, I uh, have some, our family has some acquaintance with a past nanny of his that looked after his uh, grandchildren. And, and I hear that, I hear by rumor that Sean Connery is a much nicer man than James Bond. But uh, <laughs> Anyway, the historical context is one of Bonnie Scotland. Now, that means that we enjoy Highland coos, as they say, Highland sheep, uh, uh, Highland castles, like the historic castle that the Duncan family hails from. Uh, there are lots of pastoral uh, agricultural scenes, wild Highland scenes, and there's Loch Ness. I think Nessie's right out there. <laughs> 
just off of the Urquhart Castle edge. Uh, if you're thinking about Scotland, you have to think about the Queen City of Edinburgh. Uh, here's Edinburgh in winter. Uh, these two columns here are towers, being the two towers of New College. Uh, the theological college inspired and, uh, by the disruption, built by those who were in league with Robert Murray McShane. Uh, we'll come more to the disruption in a few moments. Uh, here is where uh, the high hat, uh, the king's crown uh, of the cathedral church of St. Giles, and then off uh, on the castle rock to one side is uh, uh, the historic um, Edinburgh Castle. Uh, Scotland's uh, uh, historic uh, capital is in Edinburgh, and uh, that is where much of the theological action takes place that has ripples all over the country. But Robert Murray McShane was in the particular cultural context during his ministry of Dundee. Uh, here, uh, Dundee known for its bridge, uh, there its modern downtown area, shopping, main shopping street, but that's not the way it would have been in the day of Robert Murray McShane. It would have been more, more like this. It would have been uh, uh, something of a, of a grand uh, uh, industrial city. Uh, the people that filled this place, not all, but many, came from humble crofting backgrounds. Uh, they would have lived in uh, small homes like this one. Uh, the, the kind of version before that would have had a thatched roof and and you would have almost slept in the bed with the cow and the sheep in order to keep them from freezing in the winter. Uh, Dundee was a port city, and uh, we'll see in a moment exactly why. And it's uh, not far from Glamis Castle and some of the historic Scottish uh, monarchial uh, objects like the Stone of Scone. But Dundee is most well known for its textile industry, and that's something that we in the, in the South, and particularly in the CSRA, can appreciate. Uh, there were giant mills, and still are the remnants of them, like we have in our area, uh, textile mills all over Dundee. And there were textile workers who worked at spinning a particular kind of thread made out of a particular kind of uh, uh, agricultural material. It's, it's called jute, and they would... Uh, form a thread and then form a particular kind of cloth, this jute cloth. Burlap sacks were made out of it, but that is not what made Dundee so important and strategic for gospel ministry. It's that the jute was used for the sails of sailing ships and also for the covering of wagons in this far off place called America where people were busy pushing westward and, and expanding and taking over the land. Dundee has a very close tie to the United States for both of these reasons. Uh, the jute material was, was uh, rugged and was uh, more or less waterproof and was a great way to sail a ship or to move your family halfway across a continent. It was into this working class industrialized area that Robert Murray McShane came and ministered. But the religious context in which he was working is also very important to remember. <laughs> I grew up in a Presbyterian home, son of a Presbyterian ruling elder. I had never heard of the disruption. I uh, landed in Scotland and found myself confronted with two sets of evangelicals. One set that was still in the mainline Church of Scotland. The other that was in this thing called the Free Church of Scotland. Now, I'll confess to you, being a, a Southerner and a Scottish American, I was attracted to the word free because I thought maybe that, didn't, that meant they didn't pass plates or something. And that there was no uh, fee to get in. Uh, well, actually, they don't pass plates, but that's another issue. Uh, the disruption in Scotland occurred in uh, 1843, but there was a 10 years conflict before this. McShane died just a couple of months before the disruption that he helped plan took place. You see, there had been a, a growing problem for over 100 years in Scotland. Scotland and England united in the early 1700s, uh, but uh, they are united, but yet they have, by constitutional uh, union, some differences between them. The Scots kept their own, uh, their own educational system, their own medical system, their own legal system. And so uh, the way that justice is administered and rules are made in Scotland is profoundly different than in England. 
Uh, English common law carries no book with a true Scotsman, and, and uh, there's no such thing as judicial precedent, really, in, in the Scottish mindset. You always go back to the Constitution, and therefore the church always went back to the Bible uh, rather than following church tradition. The disruption in Scotland finds its roots all the way back in Iona and St. Columba in the earliest arrival of Christianity in that land. Uh, it finds its roots in figures like John Knox. This is one of my favorite uh, uh, statues of Knox. It's in the courtyard of New College in Edinburgh where I did my PhD. There was, I may have mentioned this to you before, there was a, a visiting uh, uh, professor from America, Dr. Uh, Bob Raymond, who's a conservative PCA man, and, and he had a, a wayward student visit him one time when he was uh, doing a sabbatical in Edinburgh. And in the courtyard of Edinburgh, uh, Dr. Raymond uh, put his former student who had, had gone to the left a bit on the spot. He said, brother, do you see who that is? And he pointed to Knox's statue. And, and the student said, yes, uh, Dr. Raymond, I see that's John Knox. And he said, and brother, do you see what that is in his hand? And the young man said, yes, Dr. Raymond, that's the Bible. And Dr. Raymond said, no, that's not the Bible. That's the Holy Bible. And he was making a, making a point to his wayward student that he should come home to the Word of God. Uh, there were a number of very important figures who contributed uh, to uh, the disruption when uh, the Church of Scotland found herself oppressed by the government. You see, in England... The church controlled the state to no small degree. And when it came to who was to be appointed a minister in a local congregation, uh, in England in many cases, the right to choose a minister had been sold for a sum of money, either to a committee or to a particular landowner, a wealthy man in the community. Can you imagine uh, one member of First Presbyterian purchasing the right to select the minister of the church? Uh, this is a strange idea, foreign to Presbyterianism. But in Scotland, at the time of the Reformation, uh, the wealthiest landowners received a gift. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church had lots of land, and that land needed to be turned over to some other party at the Reformation, other than to the Catholic Church. And so the deal struck was that they would give the land to the to the largest landowner in each parish, because obviously he knew how to handle land. And in exchange for that indefinite lease on the land, he would have the obligation of paying the minister's salary every year. So typically, once a year, there would be a payment made by the big landowner because of the land that he had received in the settlement of the Reformation. Well, fairly soon, the landowner forgot, or the children of the landowners forgot, that that land was not really theirs. And if they were paying for the minister, then they thought they ought to be able to pick him in the first place according to their own choice. And so soon the court system began to force the Church of Scotland and her presbyteries and her congregations to accept whatever minister had been selected by the most wealthy man in, the, in that parish. There were men who opposed this, like uh, Andrew Bonar and Horatius Bonar and, and uh, Hugh Miller. But the two great ones who who opposed it uh, were um, Thomas Chalmers on the one hand and William Cunningham uh, on the other. What, uh, what was the problem uh, with the selection of ministers by the wealthy man? Well, aside from the biblical issue, there was a very practical one, which at that time there was a, a kind of theological unbelief uh, called moderatism. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, a biographical introduction to William Cunningham, and it says, at the beginning of the 19th century, weakness, slumber, and death almost universally characterized the pulpits of the Church of Scotland. A scattered evangelical remnant still remained within her ranks, but for more than half a century they had struggled unsuccessfully to turn back the tide of moderatism and worldliness which had entered the national church in the 18th century. The true religion of the moderates, as the prevailing clerical party was called, was a cold appeal to virtue and morality accompanied by a lordly contempt of the evangelical message and fervor. So these are guys who, oddly enough, would go before Presbytery and swear allegiance to the Bible and to the confession of faith because that's what the state said you had to do to have your house, to have your manse. 
And then they would go into their pulpits and they would just preach moralism. That didn't take very long, it didn't take very long to prepare such a sermon. And so Church of Scotland ministers pursued uh, other avocations during the week. Uh, the best, ma best mathematicians in the land, they were moderate ministers, liberal ministers. Uh, the best astronomers, botanists, uh, they would even brag that, that they had an expert in every field of study among their clergy. Well, unfortunately, what that meant was they were an expert at everything except the gospel. And that people sitting under their preaching were being led to hell rather than to heaven. It was a very serious problem. Dr. Kidd of Aberdeen, who was no moderate, he was a good evangelical. When a young man was coming into his presbytery, because he was surrounded by moderate ministers in the presbytery, he gave a sarcastic charge to the young man upon the occasion of his ordination. He said, my young brother, you have now been set apart to the office of the holy ministry. Whatever you do, be sure that you don't overwork yourself. Why should you die before your time? There are some foolish people, as you may be aware, who go in for Sabbath schools, prayer meetings, and Bible classes. But my beloved young brother, I counsel you, carefully avoid all that sort of nonsense. He was speaking tongue-in-cheek. He loved the Lord, and he knew that the young man that he was charging loved the Lord, but he was bearing an uh, ironic message of witness, a prophetic witness, to those around him in the presbytery. This was the religious context of Scotland at the time of Robert Murray McShane. The disruption was the largest social upheaval in, medieval, uh, in uh, Victorian Britain. It was the largest political and economic and religious upheaval uh, in its own way. Uh, in Scotland, next door to every national church with uh, a minister in it who uh, had been inflicted by the government, uh, they placed another church building. Uh, they built their own seminaries, like New College in Edinburgh, and they sent out their own missionaries. Uh, the disruption painting here shows uh, the meeting of the men who refused to submit to government intrusion, and they gathered for a separate uh, dis uh, general assembly in a warehouse. Uh, in Edinburgh. This was the religious context. But what about Robert Murray McShane himself? Uh, rather than turning narrowly into a historian with you, having painted the context, I now want to speak to you about uh, something of his ministry and the lessons that we learn from his life of generous Christian ministry. Uh, we have to know a few basic facts. He's born in Edinburgh in 1813. His parents were moderates. And so he grew up in a home that acknowledged the Bible, that had some, some kind of outward motions of Christianity and religiosity, but there wasn't the heart that was present there as it should have been. Uh, he studied at the Divinity Hall in 1831, and he studied under the great leader of the disruption, Thomas Chalmers. Chalmers had been a moderate minister, an expert in mathematics, and then one day the Lord Jesus struck his heart in conviction of sin, and led him to see his need of the Savior whose pulpit he occupied and whose word he had been trampling and ignoring. And so Thomas Chalmers became a man who loved the Lord and was zealous for the things of God, and, and he was concerned not only for his own soul, but also for the whole church and the whole nation. And he ended up eventually teaching in divinity and training up a, a generation of young evangelical pastors no small fraction of which volunteered to go to the mission field. Uh, let me commend to you the uh, book that the banner also puts out called The St. Andrew's Seven. It talks about seven men who went off to the mission field, many of them losing their lives in the process, but gaining uh, great good for the gospel and the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. McShane was licensed to preach in 1835, so he spent several years in seminary. And then after an internship, as it were, he went to Dundee in 1836. And in that place, he found himself with a, a parish on the west end of town, a, a building that had been built and, and could hold uh, uh, well over a thousand people. He packed the place as he preached the Word of God, as he visited in their homes, as he led Bible studies, as he led men's groups, as he uh, helped organize 
uh, diaconal relief and care for those in the parish. Uh, This was not a narrow ministry. It was a very broad one that included all the tools in, in God's arsenal as he outlines in the Word of God. All the officers, elders and deacons both, being engaged in the lives not just of those who were communing members of the church, but the children as well, the non-communing members, and also those who resided in the parish, who were in their area, uh, on their patch, as it were. And if they were open to hearing something of the gospel, then they would take that to them. Church attendance at the time uh, was attendance which uh, uh, churchmen were very concerned about because it had fallen from the 70 percentile down to the 60 percentile and people of the population and people were worried about what that might mean for future generations. Oh, the gospel was going forth in a very powerful and personal way in St. Peter's Dundee. This young, powerful minister was asked by the Presbyterian Assembly then to leave his congregation for just about a year and to go off as a part of a study committee and look at Palestine, look at where the Jews were residing. They they were concerned to send missionaries to the Jews and they needed to know their spiritual condition and locations. This may seem like a no-brainer to you. We in MTW, uh, the PCA, and other organizations have ongoing ministry to the Jewish people, uh, to the Jew first and to the Gentile, as as it says in the book of Acts. But back uh, before the time of Robert Murray McShane and before the time of Uh, Thomas Chalmers, there were those who thought that missions, uh, that the Great Commission had nothing to do with the church. Uh, The church herself did not organize missions and send out missionaries. In England, most of the missions that had been done had been done by independent groups. And McShane himself was willing to align with members of other denominations in order to help push missions and evangelism. But when he was asked by the church to go check on the spiritual condition of the Jews, he voluntarily went. Now, in our day and age of travel, we think that would be a very nice uh, invitation to take up. We'd get on the airplane and fly over and have some nice meals and meet some nice people. But in those days, to get on a ship meant you, you stood a pretty good chance of, of dying of disease or drowning. And once you got to that land, if, if the sea and the, and the sharks didn't get you, then the mosquitoes would, and you would die of one strange disease or another in that place. But God, in his kindness, uh, protected McShane on that journey and, and looked after his congregation. William Chalmers Burns, another minister, came and filled the pulpit, and while Robert Murray McShane was away, guess what happened? A revival broke out under the interim minister. And so when McShane came back, having heard through some letters about this revival, he stepped into a situation where fervency for the gospel had dramatically increased, and he could pursue all the more uh, the kind of reforming program uh, that the free church would be known for uh, in the next generation. But he, on a pastoral visit, conducted typhus, and he died at the age of 29 in 1843 just two months short of the disruption. One who was so generous towards his people that God had called him to minister to. One who laid down his life for the things of God. He could have listened to the words of Dr. Kidd and lived at ease and protected himself from disease. Why die at such a young age? Well, the answer is because of the generosity of God in the gospel and the generosity which that also demands back. We give him back our all. And so he did not shirk from his duty of ministry. Uh, McShane's life uh, in broad brush had four basic foundations to the generosity of ministry which he lived. Uh, First of all was his conversion. We don't have a great deal of material about that, but we do know from his diary that he came under personal conviction of sin. It's not just that He heard some things about God or learned them from his parents and he decided to agree with those in a public meeting. He had done all that and had joined the church. He had been baptized as a child and and received into communing membership once he was of age and he was lost as a duck. He knew nothing of the things of Christ truly in his heart. But by his reading the word of God, by sitting under um, some reading and preaching that changed his life, he he came to a point of 
personal conversion and then calling to the ministry. It, it was Christian literature in the early days of his life which called him to repentance and faith. Because when evangelicals did not have pulpits, they would flood the area with good Christian literature. Books, tracts, pamphlets. There were other ways to evangelize uh, that had recourse to in occasion where uh, there was a, an unbelieving minister in the pulpit of a parish locally. And then there were Christian leaders in the land who he sat under, like Thomas Chalmers. He went to seminary, he learned at that man's feet, and he adopted his pattern of ministry. Chalmers was known to have a large compassion for the people of Glasgow. And he was concerned that the deacons reach out and minister not just to the members of the church, but to anyone who would identify with the church as well, even if they didn't yet have a profession of faith. There were collections taken up for the poor. Uh, there were studies done of the numbers of people in the parish, widows in the parish, orphans in the parish. They sent Sunday school classes out to count the number of bars in the parish and the number of drunk people that they saw there. They estimated the number of prostitutes. And then they went back into their deacon's court and they formulated a strategy and a plan for taking the gospel to sinners just like themselves. Christian leaders such as Chalmers recognized the responsibility that the state had, especially because it was a Christian state, to foster the true religion. And so they demanded money from the parliament in order to build what were called parliament church buildings uh, so that the gospel could be preached to the poor that were coming in from uh, the, the highlands and the rural countryside and due to urbanization were being drawn to work in the mills. Industrialization had a downside, but one of the upsides was is it, put, it put the lost in high concentration in a few places so missionaries and pastors could easily reach them with the true word of God. McShane came under personal conviction of sin and he also came to a point of seeing his dependence upon grace. You see, the moralism of the moderates meant you could earn your way with God. You would keep the Ten Commandments in an outward way. People would admire and respect you because of your station, your job, your family pedigree. Oh, Robert Murray McShane's heart was broken and he came to understand that it was only by the grace of God that he could ever have a love of Christ and a hatred of his own sin. Robert Murray McShane was a thoroughgoing Christian. He was one who came to a point of great anticipation of eternal realities. Here a young man in his 20s walking down the street ministering to people who were frankly miserable and smelly, broken uh, and dysfunctional in their person, in their relationships one with another. And what was he thinking about? Yes, relieving their condition, but also thinking about heaven and their need of a Savior and how their souls were in danger. He ministered to them along with his deacons, both in body and in soul. And he was very concerned to nurture his own soul and to cultivate holiness. You see, in a context where there's moralism, People don't care about true inward holiness. All they care about is outward form and appearance. But McShane recognized the depth of his own sin due to the work of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. And so he sought, he sought to be more Christ-like to others and to live out the love and grace of Christ uh, to those around him, even the least of them, his brethren. In his ministry, he engaged in great evangelistic and pastoral labors. He visited the sick. Now that sounds like no small thing. We expect our pastors to run down to University Hospital or, or to MCG or wherever we are. and We expect a visit and we expect one fairly soon. But you know, there are very few ministers of the gospel who die because they went on a hospital visit these days. But back at the time of Robert Rooney Shane, it was downright dangerous to go into a home. There was contagious disease and there was no aspirin. There was... Um, there were epidemics, and you could catch it too, just with a touch or a handshake. And so McShane showed himself as a laborer approved in the things of the gospel because he engaged in pastoral, door-to-door -door work with his people. Yes, he preached from the pulpit, but you know, 
the strange thing is that there are those who wrote him uh, after having sat under his ministry, and they said, I appreciated what you said. It was biblical, but really it was the way that you said it that really struck my heart quite deeply. He could connect with his people because he had visited them and knew them. Revival broke out in his congregation. And he is known as uh, one who enjoyed the blessings and benefits of revival in his ministry. But really the revival was not done by him. If any human being was to receive credit, it would have to be William Chalmers Burns. But in reality, no human gets the blessings or the credit. Uh, we don't get the credit uh, for revival. God is the one. The Holy Spirit, the wind blows where it wills. The Holy Spirit changes hearts as He wills. And it just so happened while McShane was away that revival broke out on a large scale back in his parish. And he was the beneficiary of, of reaping that fruit. You see some plow and some plant and some water and some reap the harvest. And McShane was in that enviable position. He was concerned about foreign missions, particularly to the Jews. It was no secret that at that time people understood uh, the book of Acts to instruct Christians to go to the Jews first. And since they realized that they had been neglectful of that for many generations, uh, they wondered whether that might be the reason why our Lord hadn't come back. And so for reasons of eschatology, they wanted to go to the Jews as well as obedience to the Word of God. But there was also home mission. Church planting, we would call it today. As people moved in from the rural areas, as they moved in and formed ghettos, the church had to have a, a place there as well, ministering to them. And it was up to resource-laden Christians, wealthy Christians, uh, the general church uh, collections, to put churches and church buildings in those needy area, areas. Those people were of such humble condition, they could not build a church themselves. But... Home missions led by men like Robert Murray McShane brought a church to them. And so McShane lived a life of generosity reflexively and doxologically to the glory of our Lord. If we wonder what the lessons of generosity of his life are for us, uh, what does McShane have to say to us as a model today? Uh, the first thing would be uh, he is a model of gospel experience. And that generosity has to flow from the inside, from who we are. And if we're not converted, if we haven't come to an apprehension of our sin, if we haven't had the shadow of God fall across our face, then we don't understand the glorious light and joy of His presence. The frown against sin is a precursor to understanding and appreciating and embracing uh, the smile of God and the blessing of God. And so a true gospel experience flowed in his own life and that was a, a point of generosity to others and it should be in your own life as well. Uh, have you just gone through the motions and sort of are in church because that's the thing to do or you've always done it that way? Or, or have you had a gospel experience and come to a point of seeing Jesus Christ truly as your Savior because you need one? And then secondly, uh, the gospel ministry in both word and deed. Uh, there was a concern to preach the true truth. He was in polemic against the moderates who did not preach uh, justification and sanctification as they ought. But he also was very concerned for deed ministry. Uh, this was an overflowing of Christian gratitude for all that God had done to show the love of Christ always combined with His word reaching out first to those who are in the bounds of the church and then spilling over to all the others in the parish. A gospel hand was held out with a tract in one hand or a sermon in one hand and an offer of aid in the other. Also, gospel-based revival is a lesson for us. We're good Southerners, many of us or most of us here. We know, we know instinctively that if you want to have a revival, you put a sign out front with that word on it, and then you have one. But McShane would be the first to tell us that it doesn't work that way. When there's no sign, and even when you're on vacation, that may be the time the Lord pours out His blessings on the congregation and the people of God. God is the one who fosters that. And so we pray for revival, and we work for revival, but we trust Him with the results. And then fourthly, 
Uh, There's a gospel theology at the heart of Robert Murray McShane based upon the Bible. There's a wonderful little book I want to commend to you. Um, You can see I have a few tabs marked. Uh, It's called Awakening by David Robertson, who is now uh, in the pulpit of uh, St. Peter's Dundee. the guy I did the pulpit swap with. It's a life and ministry of Robert Murray McShane. And in this volume, he has a chapter entitled, What Went Wrong? What has happened because Scotland has become a very secular place? What failed in Robert Murray McShane's ministry in St. Peter's? And he catalogs and shows how Robert Murray McShane was committed to the Bible and to the doctrine and teaching of the Bible. But the generation that came after strayed away from that, and so the church went into an extended period of decline. I'm happy to tell you today that St. Peter's Dundee is not only healthy, but thriving and affecting the world. Uh, Mission to the World uh, has partnered and networked with that congregation and with the Solas ministry that is going forth from that place. And they're ministering not only to Scotland and England, but to all of Europe from that congregation. Uh, David Robertson, the pastor, has become known uh, not for ministering to needy people in jute mills because the jute mills are all closed now, but he has become a major apologist for the Christian faith. And he is, uh, he is feared even by Oxford professors uh, with the last name Dawkins who boast and think that they can prove that there is no God. David Robertson takes them on in debate and um, shines bright for the glory of God. We can give thanks to the Lord that he is continuing to bless that people in that ground, in that town, uh, with good gospel theology based upon the scriptures. These are the lessons of generosity. Now, in my last breath, let me say, if you want to know more about Robert Murray McShane, go to McShane Info on the web. And there you will find every dissertation outlined, every work published, links to sermons, uh, to letters, addresses. You could order materials. I hope I've hooked you with Scotland and that you will, uh, that you will grow in the Lord uh, hand in hand with Robert Murray McShane. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we give you thanks and praise for the lives that you've worked in before us. We thank you for a brother like Robert Murray McShane and we pray that we might learn from him and that we too might show generosity in response to the gospel and your generosity to us. May our cup overflow, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.